and uh, then finally uh, Nina Vitoshik Fitzpatrick, researcher, poet, author, critic. Uh, thank you very much, Björn, and thank you, Shmuel. Um, I am uh, both a fiction writer and a cultural historian, and Shmuel and Björn always claim that I write, as a historian, I write fictions too. So I'm not sure uh, if the boundary between these two won't be somehow uh, deleted occasionally here in my uh, short intervention. Now, as a writer, I'm interested in modernity or in modernities as set of stories, of a cachet of various stories. And um, Daniel Bell, who has tried to define modernity in his own terms, has always pointed to the story or the leap uh, beyond as being kind of an underlying story or theme of modernity or various modernities beyond culture, beyond nature, beyond boundaries. And yes, Shalim is definitely right in uh, claiming that imperialism and colonialism uh, testifies to this uh, myth of the beyond and, and, and should be a constitutive factor uh, element in, of modernity, both imperialism and colonialism and a reaction to it. But um, uh, uh, I'd like to go back to this, to this very interesting and fascinating theme of uh, the success of modernity or of modernities as, as results of uh, mobilizations, and these mobilizations being a uh, result of an empowering story. I think we pay att too little attention to the empowering or charismatic stories which actually have brought about modernity as a project, <coughs> as a program, its success or its failure. Uh, to mention just a few such stories, I think that modern America has been uh, the result of many forces and institutions, but uh, its unparalleled success in the history of mankind is an epitome of modernity lies in two stories. The first one is the myth of the frontier, uh, which uh, demands that the Americans constantly cross and uh, transcend and overcome borders and frontiers, whether geographic, ethnic, uh, uh, political, military, galactic, and so on and so on. The second uh, story is the American dream, that you too can become a Rockefeller, a millionaire, a great Gatsby, the president of the United States, even if you are are a bumpkin from Kazakhstan, a, an idiot, a you know one-legged Albanian with AIDS. Sorry if I offend Albanians here in this in this audience. Now, this is this quintessentially modern story of, of the emancipated, self-creating, autonomous individual uh, that creates his own success and the success of America. Now, the imaginative engine of, 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 of German greatness and its constant mythical recharger, so to speak, used to be the mystique of Prussia. And surely enough, Prussia was hated by most of Germany most of the time, but it was a kind of a hatred of eunuchs for uh, Don Juan riding through hell. You know, Russia, in, uh, Prussia in embodied for a long time the dream of the modern, the passage from uh, rags to riches, the phoenix rising from the ashes, the, you know, this wonderful arit de passage from mediocrity and backwardness to the status of the major player uh, uh, in European politics. Now, Swedish modernity, the modernity of uh, which uh, Björn Wittrock is a wonderful fruit, uh, is, is not just the, not just the um, uh, modern rationality and uh, you know, the, the Swedish bureaucracy. Uh, all that is true is also the fruit of uh, uh, the myth, very influential, charismatic story of Folkeyem. You know, the myth of belonging, of togetherness, of uh, egalitarian participation. And I think he's trying to uh, keep this myth going in his uh, Scars, where I met a Swedish colleague for the advanced social studies, where I met Shmuel Eisenstadt and became familiar with, with his work. Now, um, I lived myself in a, under the Soviet regime. I spent my formative 20 years uh, in Poland, uh, where there was uh, one myth that uh, was constantly exerting a blackmail uh, on my generation, and that was the myth of, the, of, of uh, Comrade Stakhanov, the uh, superhero of the Soviet Five Years Plan, who, as we we recall, in 1935, uh, had mined two, 102 tons of coal in six hours, which was like 14 uh, times the usual quota. And I became so distressed by this myth and the imperative encoded in the myth and the story of 
of modernity that I had to emigrate to Norway, which offered a much more relaxed set of mythical stories of modernity. <laughs> and, no, the, uh, now, it seems to me that, uh, now, what is what, what I'm driving at? It seems to me that this. Um, uh, era of successful stories of modernity, the successful stories which are often actually the stories of the hubris of modernity, because uh, encoded in them or inscribed into the, to them is a story of failure, of the Icarus fall, um, is, uh, it seems to me that, that, that we are in a, coming to an end of this, we are to a kind of narrative exhaustion of modernity. In other words, the three very influential stories of, let's say, Western modernity, which are now in circulation, uh, a, the story of the clash of civilizations, uh, much debated. The second one, the, the end of history, also much debated, but it's there in circulation. And finally, the story of environmental collapse. So actually, this is what we are dealing with now. There's no mobilizing story which would actually compel us to reinvent ourselves anew and uh, you know, mobilize humanity in some wonderful project. Globalization itself is not such a project. It, is, it has a double edge, as we know. So I would like to ask uh, uh, Shmuel, or maybe the sages at this table and the previous tables, if they have any such stories, if they can point to any uh, mobilizing narrative that might actually re-inspire us again or revitalize this, this, uh, this map of exhaustion and, and uh, what, what, what John, uh, Jonathan Friedman called the post-axial um, uh, uh, you know, fat, uh, you know, fatigue. Now, um, uh, there is one such story, and it's interestingly enough, it comes from Norway, but I think it has a kind of a subdued sex appeal, namely it is the story of sustainability. You know, it's based, however, unlike the, the, the uh, story of modernity, the classical one, which was based on the beyond, now this one is based on limits. Uh, and restraints, limits to growth, limits to dispolation of the environment, and so on and so on. This is a pu classically Puritan or Lutheran story, right, that emerged from a Lutheran country and that demands from us this kind of a penitential discipline. Uh, I don't think it's going to, uh, I think there's a kind of a problem with this story at the level of social mobilization and, and implementation. And uh, it seems to me that, that, again, maybe this is not, the sustainability is over as well. So, um, is there any story? That is my first question. If I have, if, have I another two minutes, or is it, is one Please. question Please. enough? Okay. Well, I, then I po pose another question to all the sages and 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 to our mentor. Um, I know that uh, Shmuel has always had a weakness for the tattoo of of, of semiotics, and he always asked me to write this wonderful study based on the tattoo semiotics. I've never, um, I've never done it, and I feel very guilty. But I'd like to make a short uh, point here, based on the tattoo to semioticians, and uh, a point that has to do with the um, study of civilization and, and culture as such. Now, according to Yuri Lotman, who, as we know, was the wise man of the Tatsu school, uh, it is impossible to describe a culture or, or a civilization without taking into account the concept of non-civilization or non-culture. Um, a culture from the internal perspective is the sphere of organization and information, uh, uh, whereas non-culture denotes the ignorance of binding rules, chaos, entropy, the marginal, the pathological, the abnormal, and so on and so on. Now, according to Lotman, the mechanism of culture is a system which transforms the outer sphere of non-culture into, uh, into the center. You know, it, it, uh, there is this metamorphosis offices of sinners into holy men, entropy into information, and so on and so on. This is an interesting process because it shows that there is something like a principle of tension and equilibrium be between culture, non-culture, civilization, non-civilization. But the very distinction is essential for our, let's say, for the very notion of culture and civilization to be alive, to make any sense. Um, now, the archetypal Western model of this dynamic opposition culture, non-culture, uh, is that of Hellenic civilization, uh, uh, Lotman claimed, where, where you know, the, the, the cultured uh, zone was encircled and then penetrated by the barbarians. Then Dito, the uh, French Enlightenment, Dito, the American Enlightenment, uh, the, 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 the Japan under the Meiji in, uh, uh, dynasty, 
all these uh, situations and scenarios point to this uh, uh, equilibrium, culture, non-culture, non-culture encroaching upon uh, the center uh, and, and uh, the center losing its energy and absorbing the barbarian impetus. Now, um, when viewed in terms, this is, I'll be very short now, when viewed in terms of boundaries between culture and the outer sphere, post-modernity or high modernity or post-axial civilization emerges to me as a kind of a very puzzling phenomenon, namely the one in which the boundary between culture and non-culture, civilization and non-civilization, at least in our Western uh, world, are no longer uh, maintained. Uh, the, uh, there is an unprecedented accommodation and domestication of the marginal, the other, the pathological, the, you know, within the agenda of postmodernity, and the consequent loss of a unifying center. And I think in semiotic terms, that would be the kind of the crisis of, of, of modern civilization. However, there is an interesting question attached to this process, because uh, if, as Lesha Kowakowski, my own mentor from England, claimed uh, we live in the era in which there is no longer any distinction between war and peace, sovereignty and servitude, invasion and liberation, inequality and despotism, executioner and victim, man, woman, right, left, uh, ignorance and, and uh, buffoonery, uh, knowledge and ignorance, sorry, buffoonery and, and art. Uh, we know, where are we without these distinctions? Does culture and civilization make any, or civilization make any sense? And my question is, is the program uh, or is the agenda of postmodernity the agenda of modernity uh, without barbarians? In other words, does the concept of barbarity about which we are going to talk in the next session make any sense in the new context?